Hi, my name is Big Mac by Gillette. Uh, today I decided I would uh, give you guys a math video about four algebra mistakes that you need to stop making. Uh, I've had the fortune of being a, an instructor for a college algebra course as well as pre-calculus including algebra and trig and even a first semester calculus course. One thing I've noticed, people make the same algebra mistakes time and time again. Uh, in this video, I'll go over just a couple of the more common mistakes that I've seen before. Some are obviously bad, some not so much. So uh, what I'll do is for each of these mistakes, I'll first define what it is. Uh, I'll try and give my best idea of where this mistake is coming from, or at least, you know, try and give some kind of, try and figure out how, you know, getting into my students' heads uh, of why they think this is a rule. Uh, I'll look into the you know the possibility if it actually does work and under what circumstances would it work and then lastly I'll go ahead and actually just show you guys the correct algebra and you know the proper way to go through a situation like this so our first instance is multiplicative abuse way too often I have seen students try to factor things without going through the entire set of the process namely they say that if we have the product of two things, A times B equaling C, oh, then either A is C or B is C. So one example of where I've seen that occur is, suppose we have a form following equation, solve for X, so set the product of X minus 2 and X plus 4 is equal to 7. I've seen students in pre-calculus and calculus go, oh, well, if the first factor is 7, X minus 2 is 7, so X is 9, oh, this is, or the second factor is 7. Yeah, obviously, this is wrong. If you try putting either 9 or 3 uh, back into your original solution, you're not going to get 7 as your product. So why would students do this? I get the impression that students assume that when they're just solving for that one factor, that the other one is not changing at all for some reason. Although, seeing as it still has that x value in input, as long as you're changing the value of x, that other factor is still changing. Uh, another common one is, yeah, students don't check their answers afterwards. They're like, I have done this a million times since high school. This is the answer. Done. Doesn't always work quite that simply. And then lastly, uh, students will forget the importance of zero, which we'll uh, discuss in, in a second when it comes back to the correct algebra. Does it? Does this kind of strategy ever actually work? Um, in a really trivial case, suppose we had x squared, you know, x times x equaling 1. So, okay, we have x is equal to 1, or x is equal to 1. Well, that's good. But again, so you're only finding one solution to this thing. What about negative 1? You know, you would never get negative 1 out of that uh, solution the way that you were thinking about it. If you guys can think of other uh, trivial cases where a solution like this might actually work, uh, go ahead and leave it in the comments. I'd be interested in see what you guys come up with. Uh, however, going back to the correct algebra for this thing, this only works when c is equal to zero. If we have the product of two things being zero, then we know for a fact that either the first term is zero or the second term is zero, or possibly both. In terms of an equation, when we're trying to solve things equal to zero, it's okay that we're changing the value in the other factor, as long as we still have zero times something, or something times zero, even if that something is technically changing, we're still going to get zero as our product. So that's why we can do it in a situation like this when we're trying to solve for a function, or solve for an equation by factoring. So going back to our previous example, uh, if we actually multiplied everything out, and then subtracted our 7 term, it turns out that we could actually refactor this uh, equation properly, and then we could get two uh, correct solutions, x being 3 or being negative 5. Upon plugging either of those back into the original solution, you do in fact get a product of 7. One thing that has impressed me uh, with the math that I have seen students do is even at this level, I still see students do the following uh, step. They have the, f the fraction 1 over x plus a, they'll divide that into 1 over x plus 1 over a. Seriously. I have students do this all the time. Uh, I have an example here on the bottom. 
Again, if you guys aren't familiar with calculus, then don't worry about it too much. But again, the point is you cannot just split up a fraction like that. Period. Don't. Don't. Exclamation mark. Don't do it that way. So why do students think they can do this? In all honesty, I'm not sure. I guess the idea is that if students think that they can do it with the numerator, why can't they do it with the denominator? And in fact, I've sometimes seen uh, students where th to try and match things up, they also they will put one half in the numerator of each of their two fractions. So it will be one half over x plus one half over a, just so that the numerators and the denominators would add up to the original fraction. It doesn't work like that. I think what happens in these situations is students forget what least common denominator means. In terms of when this uh, really bad mistake would actually work, like for what values of x and a could this thing actually possibly be true? Well, if we actually were to split up this fraction into 1 over x plus 1 over a, then by the process of the least common denominator, we could rewrite that as x plus a over the quantity x times a. At that point, we can then we have two fractions. We can either cross multiply however you want to in order to solve these things. We have the equation x plus a quantity squared equaling x times a. Of course, if your student can successfully uh, distribute that uh, squared uh, binomial and then subtract the xa term, you get the equation x squared plus ax plus a squared is equal to zero. Solving for either for x or for a, your choice, uh, it basically comes out the exact same uh, look at look, it looks the exact same either way you're using it. Uh, basic quadratic formula would work in this situation. But solving for x, uh, you get inside of the square root, inside of the discriminant actually, you get the term minus 3a squared. But assuming you're dealing with a positive number here, a is just you know 5 or 2 or 7, something like that, uh, negative 3a squared is going to be a negative value. And you are not supposed to take the square root of a negative value. Uh, if we admit the possibility of imaginary numbers, then we could actually include this into our solution. And I actually should uh, have split up the bottom uh, solution as negative one half plus or plus uh, root three over two i and negative one half or minus root three over two i. Just I should have split that up into their proper real and imaginary forms. How, or you can rewrite it in polar form, as you can see there. If you guys are not familiar with that, then don't worry. But point of the matter is, when this would when would this actually work? Never, unless you're dealing with imaginary numbers, and even still, it's probably not going to work. So maybe you know there's a possibility where like if both a and x were zero, but then you would be have then you would have one divided by zero to start with, and well, that just really makes no sense. Another bad mistake that I have seen way too many times is the following setup. Suppose you have like a, a fraction, uh, we have mx plus b up on top, you want to divide the whole thing by m, alright great, the m's cancel out, and you are left with the term x plus b. This makes This one makes my brain hurt a little bit. I have an example on the bottom where apparently that minus 4 cannot be touched. You cannot disturb it. it. It is sacred in that respect. And then you just carry it all the way through and of course you're going to get the wrong answer. So why would students do this? Well, basically because they're always told to cancel things out and the second they see something that is in both the numerator and the denominator, their instinct says, okay, let's just cross these things out with complete disregard to everything else that they've ever learned. Uh, another thing that just pops up in, from these situations is students forget that they can just, you know, if they have mx plus b as a numerator, they could split that into two separate fractions. Likewise, if you try to factor out that m term, uh, something's going to happen to that b uh, value that we're going to mount is on the other side of it. So, when would this work? You know, if you just can't, you know crossed out the M's and you would have the correct answer. Well, a couple of really trivial cases, really dumb cases, is if B were zero, so you're not actually adding anything, or if M were one, as in you're dividing everything through by one, so you're not actually changing your value of your equation. Um, you know, I've actually had students say, "Oh, well, what about if M is zero? 
If m is 0, then why are you dividing by 0? Seriously. Again, sometimes students forget these basic concepts and they try and get lost in the algebra and some of the other material and they forget these basic steps that sometimes they need a refresher on. Uh, going through the correct algebra, I express it here in two situations. The first case is we can actually just split this up into two separate fractions. So we have m times x divided by m and then plus b over m. So obviously for that first fraction, m times x divided by m is just x and we have plus b over m by itself as the second part of that sum. In the second line, suppose we wanted to factor out the value of m uh, from the numerator. Uh, we could do that, so then we would have the product of m times x plus b over m. So now that we have a product of two things in the numerator, divided both by m, all we have left is the second term, x plus b over m. Uh, the last one that I'm just going to talk about today is a notion of Students, you know, they try and figure out ways to factor polynomials in their head. Usually, we, you know, obviously students start with just simple quadratics. However, you know, often when students are asked to show their work in some in some fashion, uh, a common way to try and introduce this is the notion of factoring by grouping. So you might actually break down the middle term into two other parts that you can factor nicely, and that way you can actually show your work in, in terms of how you factor a polynomial. However, Often what I see, what I've seen is that students will just arbitrarily pick two numbers that the middle number will break down to. So in this situation, minus 9x breaks down into minus 3x and minus 6x. Sure, this is true. Uh, they then try and factor the two terms on the left and the two terms on the right. And then they somehow combine all of these different factors together. Which, of course, if you were to try and redistribute that whole thing out, will definitely not be the quadratic you had at the beginning, let alone a quadratic polynomial. In this situation, it would become a cubic polynomial. So, why would students do this? They know that they have to try and factor out their terms in some notion, but they often forget other properties, such as the distributive property and the commutative property. And again, little things like, what is the degree of your answer? You know, that stuff gets completely overlooked sometimes. You know, if students realize, students realize that, they, that their answer was going to be a third order polynomial, they would know that something was wrong. So when would this type of really bad mistake actually work? I don't, well, I couldn't really think of any examples right off the top of my head, even just plugging in numbers instead of just using some variables. If you guys can come up with one, again, I'd love to see it in the comments. In terms of the correct algebra for this uh, particular situation, what we needed to do is we wanted to break down this middle term into something so that when we factor both the, the two terms on the left and the two terms on the right, that there is a common factor on both parts. That way, we can then factor that thing out. So in this situation, for the minus minus x term, we can actually break that to plus 3x and minus 12x. Uh, the two terms on the left have a factor of x plus 3, and the two terms on the right have a factor of x plus 3. At this point, since they both have the same factor, now we can pull that factor out, and then we are left with the other term being x minus 12. So, what do we learn from all this? So, obviously, you know, I'm by the point where I am teaching these students uh, college algebra, trigonometry, pre-calculus, calculus 1, you know, it's not my job by this point to reinforce algebra uh, curriculum. You know, make sure that they're doing everything correctly. Uh, unfortunately, students often just got, you know, basically students go through such a rigmarole of these particular instruments that, you know, they just follow shortcuts that they think are working all the time because their teachers tell them that they're working enough. You know, one of my one of my best measures of how well a student will do in a college algebra course. I can ask, as I ask them, you know, on the first day of class, what is the quadratic formula, you know, for solving a standard uh, quadratic equation? Of the students that can uh, solve the, that, that can, you know, spit it out verbatim, they'll usually get a B. Of those students that can actually get it, I ask them, where did that come from? Most of them have no idea, they just remember the formula and absolutely no idea of what the context was. If a student tells me, like on day one, that it comes from completing the square, 
odds are pretty good that their stat student's going to get an A because they've paid attention not just to what the formulas represent, but the context of how these things are set up and in what instances we can use these different kinds of shortcuts or other uh, other methods that we can use to simplify uh, these particular kinds of equations. Lastly, check your work. Please, for my sake, for your teacher's sakes, please check your work. All right, Big Mac saying, later.